Hi, I'm Beckme Berserker and welcome back to my channel and to yet another exploration of a classic Beckme adventure module. This time we're going to explore what many agree is one of the greatest adventure modules ever written. I know that's a label that gets tossed around quite a bit, but I'm not only going to tell you it's the case, I'm going to show you why. Watch out though, there are major spoilers ahead. I am of course talking about B10 Night's Dark Terror, written by Jim Bambra, Graham Morris and Phil Gallagher of TSR UK and published in 1986. This adventure module not only took you out of the dungeon and into the wilderness, but introduced you to a dynamic environment, steeped in ancient history, which included a multitude of factions and important actors. What we must focus on first is how this module is framed. Based upon the convention at the time, its label of B10 suggested it was a basic level adventure, so for levels 1 to 3. However, Night's Dark Terror was marketed as a basic expert transition module. So what did this mean? Well, as the text states, Night's Dark Terror was designed to let the players experience the thrill of discovering a fantasy setting, and that this module enabled the transition from what had been a more dungeon-based play to wilderness campaign play with little difficulty. In short, there were going to be dungeons, but getting from one place to another will also be part of the adventure. In terms of this adventure's presentation, Night's Dark Terror was one of the most packed out adventure modules of its day. Consisting of 64 pages of content, which was double the average sized module, it included a wealth of support material. Not only did it consist of the usual removable cover that had this beautiful map of Eastern Karamekos printed on the inside, but it came with a second cardstock DM screen littered with maps of no less than seven separate locations. And on the reverse of this was a map of an intriguing ancient temple and an image of a strange geometric pattern. In addition, we were supplied with the Pièce de Résistance, an A1-sized battle map of a homestead called Sukiskin that supported the running of one of the early scenarios, which goes a bit like a running battle. Clearly, the game's designers knew this scenario would be most effective if supported by a map, so that the locations of PCs and enemies might be known. What's really interesting about this is that, up to this publication, D&D had mostly been sold as a Theatre of the Mind product, although that phrase was not used back then as far as I'm aware. D&D was a product of your imagination, so to be offered a battle map was a little unusual, but not unwelcome when it came to running the scenario associated with this map. What's really awesome about this map is its scale. It isn't stuck in the game's legacy of printing everything at 10 feet square. Here we see that the scale is 5 feet square, so a lot more practical when trying to explain how many creatures are occupying a single square. As for those creatures, we were also supplied with punched cardstock, consisting of tokens that may be used in lieu of miniatures. As I already stated, D&D was a game of the imagination, so many players would not have had miniatures. Night's Dark Terror filled this void, and you can see here I made good use of them. I feel like a shopping channel presenter because I keep saying, wait, there's more. And there is. Turning over the A1 battle map, and we were supplied with maps of no less than 9 locations to support the progress of this game. Truly, this was epic stuff, and in my opinion, I think one of the reasons Night's Dark Terror has remained a fixture of nostalgia for Beckman players has been the quality of this content, even before we get into the actual writing. I mean, apart from, I think, X10, Red Arrow Black Shield, published the year before, no other Beckme adventure module came with such an array of material. Okay, so that's the physicality of the product out of the way, but what was Night's Dark Terror about? How did it work? What made it such a deep and rich adventure? Well, the first thing to acknowledge is the setting. Although this adventure is placed within the Grand Duchy of Karamekos, the information about the region is enriched with detail about its ancient history and recent events leading to the situation the characters find themselves in. In addition, the writers used two specific approaches that gave Night's Dark Terror the depth it is famous for. Specifically, these are the tactics of zooming in and the use of breadcrumbs. I'll elaborate more on these approaches as I move through this video. But first, let's examine the backdrop of this adventure by becoming familiar with the region's ancient history and more recent events. We are first informed that, millennia ago, the lands of northern and eastern Karamekos were part of the Hutakan Empire. The Hutakans were a jackal-headed, humanoid race, originating from an obscure valley deep within the Black Peak Mountains. Although obsessed with cultural and religious pursuits in the name of a deity called Fla, they achieved dominance over the primitive human culture living in the area at that time, known as the Traldar. Although the influence of the Hutakans spread across the lowlands, their valley of origin remained their most important site. There they erected a temple to Fla, 
and their religious-based society flourished. Soon the priestesses of Fla were denying entry to the valley without their permission and concealing its location from all but trusted clerics of the lowlands. In order that the valley's location would not be forgotten, the high priestess declared that tapestries be made for these clerics to keep, upon which were detailed strange geometric patterns. However, these clerics were also supplied with a magical silver needle with a length of gold thread attached. By touching the needle to the tapestry, the thread would weave through the patterns of the tapestry and detail a sophisticated map that could lead these clerics back to the hidden valley of Hutaka. These needles and tapestries were to become the priestesses' symbols of office, and when they died, they were buried with them. However, the lowlands were later invaded by a null horde that tore through the empire. The Hutakans were not prepared for this, and, facing extinction, retreated back to their hidden valley, convincing the Traldar to protect their retreat. The main problem with this was that the location of their hidden valley was out there, in the tombs of dead priestesses. It was too dangerous to seek them out, and also incredibly sacrilegious to exhume the dead. Therefore, the Hutakans put their trust in Fla, and withdrew from common knowledge, to live isolated from the rest of the world with their Traldar subordinates. As the face of Garamekos changed over the years, the isolated Hutakans and Traldar had their own problems. The Traldar began to revolt against how they were being treated, and the two races began to live apart from each other. The Traldar have reverted to their barbaric ways, and the two communities currently coexist in a tense environment, where frequent skirmishes still occur. Today, both races number at just around 250 each. The world outside of the Lost Valley of Hutaka has moved on and is very different, but that doesn't mean it's a better place. The Iron Ring, a slaver organization based out of the Black Eagle Barony, is operating with a fair bit of impunity within Karamekos, stealing away captured prisoners to sell on the black market. An ancient manuscript found on a captured elf recently found its way to Golfar, one of the lesser masters of the Iron Ring. A magic user of some power, Golfar became obsessed with the lost wealth of this seemingly forgotten Hutakan Empire. He set out to look for one of its lost cities, called Sitaka, but once there, found further manuscripts detailing that the Hutakans fled with their wealth during the time of the Null invasion. However, Golfar's investigations were not without fruit. With the help of Hobgoblin Muscle, the magic user located an ancient tapestry with its magical needle within a crypt in the settlement. But on seeing how the thread weaved through the patterns to show the location of Hutaka, the tapestry suddenly crumbled to dust before it could show the valley. All Golthar was left with was the needle. Golthar was far from dismayed and has sought the location of another tapestry, eventually coming across the babbling of a captured slave who declared that what Golthar seeks hangs in one of the homesteads in eastern Karamekos. But the slave was unable to state confidently which one. It was time for action. Golfar used his hobgoblins to rally the goblin tribes of the Dimrak Forest to attack numerous homesteads, all under the watchful eye of his hobgoblin lieutenant, Vlack, who was to bring the tapestry back to Zitarka, where Golfar currently resides. As for the Iron Ring, for now they are supporting Golfar's efforts. Whatever homesteads are burned will produce a nice stock of slaves to be sold to market. As long as it supports the economy of the Iron Ring, Golfar can do what he wants. So with that introduction of what's come before, we have been given a context for the events the characters will be facing, as well as an introduction to the main antagonist and their motivations. So now that we've understood this context, it's time for us to examine the adventure timeline. As you can see, the contents of Night's Dark Terror seem quite extensive, but each section needs a deeper dive to really get under the skin of this module and demonstrate its excellence. Let's start with getting started, of course. This forms part of the introductory chapter and kicks off the adventure in pretty mundane fashion, where the party is hired by a man called Stephen, whilst in a logging town called Kelvin. Stephen is looking for people to help him escort some horses from his homestead of Sukiskin to sell to the Kalari elves in the village of Riflian. Stephen lets the party know that he has other business in the meantime, but to meet him at Sukiskin in a week's time, giving the party directions and making arrangements for their travel upriver. And that's it. That's how the adventure starts. So now we're into the Siege at Sukiskin chapter. As the party travel up river on their way to the homestead, they are attacked by what they assume to be simple bandits, demonstrating that all is not well in the region. However, on defeating these bandits, the party notices that each one is branded with the symbol of a pair of manacles linked by a chain. A clue to something? No one knows anything at this stage, but this is the first example of the writers using the clever tactic of breadcrumbs to grow the campaign world as the party journey through it. 
In fact, I'd go as far as to argue that this first breadcrumb is actually the first stitch that the writers have sewn into the plot, and that its thread metaphorically represents the golden thread of the Hutarkan priestesses, in that it will lead the party through the many plot devices towards the Lost Valley of Hutarka. I'll demonstrate this visually throughout this video by putting a needle and thread symbol next to the event that drives the plot, like this one. As for the bandits, they are, of course, members of the Iron Ring, and the players now have information on how to identify them, although at this stage they don't know how relevant that is. On eventually reaching Sukiskin, the party are well and truly thrown into the action, as they come across the place just as it is being attacked by three separate goblin tribes, led by Golfar's hobgoblin lieutenant, Flak, although the party don't actually learn of Flak until later in the adventure. At this stage, the party must just get inside the homestead and help defend it. Now I want you to just think about how you as a player deals with this information in the moment. You arrive at Sukiskin, but find it aflame and under attack. Why? You reach its wooden bridge that leads to its gatehouse, but are ambushed by murderous goblins dressed in wolfskins. What type of goblins are these? You battle your way through before reinforcements arrive and are admitted by Sukiskin's inhabitants, who welcome your armed support. Who are these people, and why have they attracted the ire of the goblins? Obviously this scenario is much more than a bit of combat. Immediately there are questions to be answered, but there are also goblins to defeat first. After learning that the horses have been stolen by goblins referred to as the Viper tribe and that they have run off with them, the players are told that the remaining Wolf Skull and Red Blade tribes are continuing with the assault. Why? What could the goblins want beyond the horses? And isn't it unusual that goblin tribes work together? I just want to draw your attention here to these goblin translations of their tribe names. This is an excellent touch by the writers. This is the kind of world building tactic that separates generic encounters from meaningful ones. You don't even need to expand any more on this. The names demonstrate that not all goblins are the same, and their descriptions support this. This is all the players need to pique their interest, and to help the DM fill the gaps. The siege at Sukiskin resolves over the course of the night, and it is the A1 map of Sukiskin that aids the players and Dungeon Master to do this, with the module's text detailing the direction of each assault by the goblins and their subsequent behaviours as well as numerous events that might happen over the night to tempt the characters out into open conflict, or have them running to defend different areas of the homestead. We are also given information on how the inhabitants of Sukiskin help in the defence. These inhabitants turn out to be Stephen's extended family, led by his brother, Piotr, who are served by a number of homestead staff. Although the significance of the item cannot be known at this point, the party will notice a tapestry hanging in the main hall of the homestead, consisting of strange geometric patterns. What's very clear at this stage is that Stephen hasn't made it back to Sukiskin. If the party are defending Sukiskin successfully, the Wolf Skull tribe give up in disgust before the hated sun rises, mounting their dire wolves and going after the vipers for running away with the horses. The Red Blades, however, decide on a final assault, throwing everything at the homestead. Hopefully this results in the party and the homesteaders fending them off, and the subsequent death of the Red Blade Goblin King, so that the adventure can continue. The next morning, there is no time to waste. The fortunes of Sukiskin are wrapped up in their ability to sell their horses to market, so the next thread in this plotline is sown as the party is asked to help track them. This results in the simple following of the horses and the goblins' tracks, which eventually leads to evidence of a battle between the wolf skulls and the vipers. It's clear from this scene that the wolf skulls were not happy with the vipers giving up the siege and making off with the easy equine pickings, and the vipers clearly came off worse although the party are able to make out a breakaway track of what looks like some vipers escaping with the horses. This leads to what looks to be a bandit camp, led by an elf called Fjordral. She's not interested in any pleas for the horses to be returned, so the party must either buy them back for silly money or resort to violence. This battle could go any way, as Fjordral has a sleep spell, which could take out a small party fairly easily. When I run this scenario, I give the players a gentle reminder if they need one, that elves are spellcasters, just by mentioning that Fjordril was reading her spellbook before greeting the party. Assuming the party take down Fjordril quickly, there are only four more bandits in the camp, and they are quite likely to just run away. So this means that the party can return to Sukiskin with the horses without further difficulty. However, once there, they are met by refugees of the nearby settlement of Ilyakana, and learn that Sukiskin was far from the only homestead that had been attacked, and that on the night before the attack on Sukiskin, Ilyukana was attacked by the same goblin tribes. 
What's of greater importance is that it is confirmed that Stephen was at Ilyukana at the time, and was taken prisoner by the Wolfskull tribe, so yet another thread is sown. It's worth pausing here to explore the presentation of Sukiskin beyond the events of the siege, because the writers went into a significant amount of depth about each person living there. Not only were we given the names, role and combat stats for each person, but we were also given information on their appearance, the clothes they wore, their personalities and other extra information, presented in the format you can see in this description of Piotr. There are nine personalities in total at the homestead, as shown in this table, and together with this extensive information, a good dungeon master has the opportunity to bring each one to life through appropriate roleplay. This works extremely well every time I run this module, and it has the effect of creating a bond between the Sukiskin clan and the characters, which is necessary to develop to give the party a reason to continue to put their lives at risk for them. So with the recovery of the horses and the knowledge that Stephen has been captured, this effectively ends the Siege at Sukiskin chapter. Although one might argue that the chapter was quite linear in that it drives the character's actions to a specific point, I believe it's necessary to reach that point before we come to what is in my opinion the strongest and most exciting chapter in the module, South of the River. South of the River is where what started to look like a standard linear adventure pulls on all the positives of expert level play and becomes, for want of a better description, a bit of a sandbox. Piotr sheepishly asks the party to help his family once more and rescue his brother. Apart from the fact that the characters may be forming a relationship with the clan, they also have an opportunity to try to understand what's going on in the region. Although the specific location of the Wall Skull Lair is not known, clues might be found in the Dimrak Forest or elsewhere in the local area. It's in this chapter that the tactic of zooming in I mentioned earlier becomes a lot more apparent. Within the expert rules, we were presented with a map of the known world, and then another map of the Grand Duchy of Karamekos. Part of this is represented on the inside cover of this module, labelled Eastern Karamekos, and the South of the River chapter requires us to explore this region to try to find Stephen, so we need to zoom in further so that the land can be fully brought to life. What exemplifies the dynamism of this region is that we are offered quite detailed side plots that have little to do with the main story, but are sewn together quite nicely so that they're not isolated from each other. In addition, the module comes with a nifty little weather generator that can really help bring the wilderness to life. As they wander around looking for the wolf skull lair, they may get pulled into other activities. They're adventurers after all, and who can resist the possibility of magical treasures in abandoned places? But the thread of this adventure is never really lost during these explorations, and the party is expected to return to Sikiskin often for supplies and rest. So sticking with this map for the moment, the party learnt from the Ilyukana refugees that the goblins have attacked numerous homesteads, and as they explore the region, they can learn more about these and possibly discover further clues. They will, of course, already be familiar with the Wolf Skull and Viper battle site they found previously, as well as Fjordaril's bandit camp, so they may want to see if tracks towards any of the goblin lairs can be picked up from there. The text does not explicitly say what tracks can be found in respect to finding these lairs, but one thing the dungeon master is asked to do is ensure the Wolf Skull lair is found last. I achieved this through a bit of misdirection here and there until I handed the party the thread they needed. However, it's clear that a bit of savvy dungeon mastery is required to run this chapter so that things line up in the right order. That said, if your players do somehow stumble upon the Wolf Skulls earlier than you liked, nothing is really lost except, perhaps, a couple of side quests. Focusing on those side quests for a moment, the chapter refers to these as Other Encounters, which consist of the Lake of Lost Dreams where the party can help a group of elves deal with a bunch of pesky pixies that have stolen a statue from them, which they want recovered. The island is taboo for elves, as they believe it is haunted. This can lead to another adventure in a gold mine to the north, where the party can help some dwarven miners discover what's been causing some of them to go missing, on top of dealing with some nasty orcs. Then there is the tombs on the ridge, which are burial mounds that can be seen from some distance away, and may entice the players to take a closer look. That second DM screen I showed you earlier supports the entire South of the River chapter, detailing the three goblin lairs and the other locations. As I've said, the other encounters are not necessary if you wish to stick strictly to the plot. However, their strength is their world building element. Whilst the characters are out and about trying to find Stephen, the world keeps turning and other stuff is going on. These other encounters are a great reminder that there is so much more going on than what the characters see and good DMs may want to expand these scenarios to have more significance later. It's all there for inspiration. Once the DM is ready to have the characters locate the Wolf Skull Lair, 
the scenario may progress as normal. And wouldn't you know it, the party learn from a rescued old female prisoner named Babushka that Stephen has been transported elsewhere, to a place she heard the goblins call Sitarka, to meet with someone called Old Skinny Legs. Both these names are meaningless to the party, who at this point are most likely to return to Sikiskin to regroup, but not without also learning that the goblins have been searching for a great map, but the characters do not learn the form of this map. This should lead to the party understanding the reason for the attacks on the homesteads, and perhaps getting them to look for a map at Sukiskin. Once back at the homestead and discussing this information, no one knows the location of this Sitaka or any great map. However, the elderly members of the family suggest that the party seek what they refer to as the Horsemen of the Moor for answers. The party are told of some strange and dubious ways of summoning this horseman, and after following these rituals, meet with Loshad, who is a Chevelle, a centaur-like creature that can shape change into a horse. Loshad knows the location of Sitaka, but will only offer it should the party deal with a werewolf pack that has been hunting the wild horses of the moor. This leads to yet another side quest, but hopefully results in the party being successful and Loshad letting them know where Sitaka is. And with that, the south of the river chapter ends. So to recap, Pyotr asks the party to look for Stephen, his brother. They have learned that numerous homesteads have been attacked over the course of recent days, but do not know why. The party set out to seek the lairs of the goblin tribes, but during the course of their adventures are pulled into a number of side quests. Eventually the wolf skull lair is located and the goblins defeated, but not before realising that Stephen has been relocated to a place called Zitaka to meet a character called Old Skinny Legs. Heading back to Sikiskin with this news, the party learn from the family elders that the location of Zitaka might be known by the Horseman of the Moor who the party meet and make a deal with to destroy a pack of werewolves. Loshad, the horseman, then shares the location of Zitaka and a further thread is sewn so that the game can move on to the next chapter. Before I move on to that chapter, I just want to give a few comments. The first is that, if you think about it, the writers did not have to give us the amount of detail in this chapter that they did. If they left out the island, the mine, the tomb locations, I don't think anyone would have thought the game was missing anything. However, it's all about what was added to make the environment of Eastern Karamekos a dynamic one, one that has stuff going on it beyond the immediate requirements of the adventure, and this brings the region to life. This also enabled the party to accumulate wealth and magical items and strengthened them in preparation for future encounters. The way I ran this chapter between the adventure locations was that, due to Sukiskin being the only homestead that survived, I made it so that it attracted the refugees from each of the homesteads that didn't, the effect of this was that, over time, Sukiskin was showing signs of becoming a small village, with numerous families of a shared culture coming together to be stronger. Each time the party returned, something at Sukiskin had changed, with Piotr becoming the default village leader. I was able to mix this up with cultural activities like goat football and communal food preparation, like fermentation or cheese making. The whole thing led to Sukiskin becoming a significant place in the heart of the characters, and one they wanted to protect. So with that in mind, it shouldn't be too long before the party are heading into the next chapter, Ruins of Sitaka. This chapter has much more of a standard setup, in that the party are expected to find Stephen and return him home. But the writers do a great job at evoking an ancient, long abandoned settlement that is so worn away, it has almost become part of the natural environment. And of course, that environment has been made difficult for the characters. Loshad's directions turn out to be completely dependable and the party are able to ford the Valaga River to reach the north bank. However, they are met by Iron Ring bandits, who by this time the party should be able to dispatch efficiently. Zitaka itself is presented as an ancient settlement that was built into the walls of a gully that cuts into an escarpment rising from the northern banks of the Valaga. The settlement is dominated by a ruined tower, which does provoke a criticism from me about the introduction of this location. That is, presumably, this tower could be seen from a distance, and I think the homesteaders of the region would have known about it, and so it wouldn't have been such a secret. However, I explain this away quite simply, in that the location was known about, but that it wasn't known that it was once called Zitaka. So when the location of Zitaka is eventually learned from Loshad, and if the party returned to Sukiskin first, you can probably have Piotr say, Well, if I'd known it was called that, I could have told you days ago. Zitaka has a kind of haunted abandonment about it, and this is capitalised on by the writers, who have placed creepy wild baboons that scream at the adventurers from within some of the buildings, but others are occupied by yet another goblin tribe 
the Yellow Fang or Fuzz Pluck. Although not obviously difficult opponents, devious DMs could make wonderful use of the environment. I mean, just take a look at this map of Sitaka. It's a veritable rabbit warren, just perfect for goblin gorilla style tactics. I like to get my players thinking, so setting up an organised defence can add a bit of grit to the running of this game, especially when you consider that the tower is defended by Vlack's bloodhead hobgoblins. With Vlack marshalling the movement of the yellow fangs, a lot of fun can be had. Should the party defeat the goblins and hobgoblins, there will be the inevitable confrontation with Vlack and his ice wolf steed, whose icy breath has taken down a number of unsuspecting characters in previous campaigns, whose last words are usually, but I thought it was just a wolf before expiring in ignominy. The expiration of the tower leads to a room where Golthar, who is of course old skinny legs, is interrogating Stephen on the whereabouts of the map he is looking for. What's curious about this encounter is that the room they're in renders everyone invisible, even if they attack. So the party can hear what's going on, but not see anything. They then notice a yellow-robed man, who is Golthar, escape the room at the opposite side when he flees the invisibility room. This leads to the party trying to locate Stephen, but perhaps not realising that there is an invisible minotaur in the room who can detect invisibility. The culminating battles of this chapter are actually very exciting. The invisible minotaur can be a deadly foe if none of the party can detect it, but once it's down, this leads to a chase to apprehend Golthar. This develops as a tense scene where the magic user is hidden behind the walls of an art gallery in the next tower level, casting spells through holes where the portrait's eyes should be running between the pictures as needed. In addition, two animated jackal-headed statues help defend the magic user. Once Golthar has run out of options, he flees to his room above. Although exciting, this scenario does present the DM with a problem due to the map not being very helpful. As you can see here, the portraits are labelled A, B, C and D, but there are walls here stopping the access as stated in the main text. In addition, access to the stairs going up is also not apparent from behind these portraits. I have to admit, I've hand waved this and the players have not noticed, but it is still a little frustrating that the map doesn't match the text. Anyway, Golfar's escape upstairs has him casting a fly spell and potentially fleeing the fight if he hasn't been killed first, and the party are able to rescue Stephen, but in all the chaos, Golfar has forgotten many treasures, including the magical Hutakan needle. In addition, the party come across a peculiar bit of foreshadowing in the form of an ancient Hutakan scroll that contains a line that should have them asking all kinds of questions. I, Baisket, High Priestess, do command your return to Hutaka. The stars have changed and our power wanes. Strange creatures harry us from the mountains and our people grow restless. We are stretched too thin. Bring the treasures of the temples and the people of the lowlands to feed the one. The sacred tapestries and your silver needles show the path. So clearly we have some explanation of the tapestry's existence but what should be jumping out is the line, bring the treasures of the temples and the people of the lowlands to feed the one. What is this one? And does the line mean what it seems to suggest? Suddenly the adventure has taken a bit of a dark turn, and yet another thread is sewn through this adventure, and another line of inquiry revealed. But what the players are relieved to learn from the rescued Stephen is that he knows the significance of the magic needle, and that they must return to Sukiskin immediately. And so begins the journey to Threshold chapter, where Stephen is reunited with his jubilant family, but before long he leads everyone to one of the tapestries hanging in the hall that they've likely been ignoring all this time, and he touches the magic needle to it. The needle suddenly darts through the tapestry, trailing its golden thread and changing what looked like a plain tapestry of geometric patterns to a map revealing the location of the Hutark and Lost Valley. And so the metaphorical thread is also sewn, and the party now have a lead in terms of what to do next. What's interesting here is that Stephen wants to join the party and can be used as an NPC or given to another player. We're told that he wants to see the mystery through, but in terms of mechanics, this offers the players some reinforcement for some difficult encounters to come. What I find really cheeky is Stephen's argument for going along, which is that the party haven't completed the initial job of escorting the horses yet, so they should all head to Riflian, sell the horses and then head on to Threshold and beyond. Talk about taking liberties. Now it would be really easy at this stage to hand wave this activity and just move the party onto Threshold. But here is another example of zooming in and bringing the environment to life. Whilst the party make plans to head towards Riflian, Golthar deploys the Iron Ring to several locations to intercept them and the tapestry. If Golthar is dead, then we're told to use a replacement NPC, but mechanically they are interchangeable. 
The party are likely to meet some of the Iron Ring at Misha's Ferry, but what happens after that is up to the characters. For one, they are intercepted by Loshad, who tells of an Iron Ring camp to the north, who have many captured slaves. Loshad's motivation is actually for the party to free the Iron Ring's horses, but the party have an opportunity to hurt the Iron Ring and emancipate its prisoners. Otherwise, the party may head to Gnome's Ferry and encounter Iron Ring members there. Throughout this chapter, they should feel pursued and on guard. When the Sukiskin horses are sold at Riflian, the journey to Hutaka can begin in earnest. But on the road to Threshold, they are ambushed by another bunch of bandits called the Skange, who have been hired by the Iron Ring to intercept the party. Again, the party will feel like they're being dogged every step of the way, so seeking refuge in Threshold for a few days should seem like a reasonable idea. By the time they arrive there, they should be in need of some decent rest and supplies. The journey to Threshold is yet another chapter that has that sandbox feel, supported further by this map, adding even more detail to the locations mentioned. The characters can go in any direction, but they feel the tightening of the Iron Ring wherever they go, and supporting this with cross-country travel and the weather system generator in this module gives the whole endeavour some sense of realism. In my opinion, what's key to running this chapter well is not allowing the party to trust anyone they speak with. By feeding their paranoia that no one can be trusted, you can keep a party continuously looking over their shoulder, so that when they reach Threshold, they can at least feel safe, even though they're anything but. The Threshold chapter introduces a change of pace to the adventure. Although there are events here for progressing the story, we are also given information on the setup of the town itself, that can be useful for any adventures played here, such as an overview of the town's customs, laws, inns at the character's disposal, and the rulership. We are also informed of what the locals might know in response to questions the party might have, such as about the Iron Ring, or the Black Peak Mountains, where the Hutaka Valley should lie. And we are also introduced to one of the best-named NPCs ever, Sergeant Arthol. The main event though, when it comes to moving the adventure along, is Goldfar's attempt to lure the party to a nefarious part of town and ambush them. We are offered a couple of suggestions on how this lure might work, including the use of a weir rat pack, acting suspiciously. But essentially, the party should be enticed enough to explore an abandoned inn, called the Cross Swords, on the belief that they will, in fact, be ambushing Golthar. Golthar is not at the inn, but a terrifying troll is, which might be difficult to defeat. And if the party survive, Golthar and his Iron Ring cronies will be waiting outside to pounce on the weakened adventurers. However, there are plenty of opportunities for the party to see through some of these preparations and turn the tables on Golthar. The whole chapter has a cat and mouse vibe, and no one is really sure who is the cat and who is the mouse at any time. Ultimately, victory for the party should be the demise of Golthar, which should end the Iron Ring's interest at this stage. That said, we are told if Golthar escapes once again, he should dog the adventurers all the way to the Lost Valley, and it would be up to the Dungeon Master how his part in the adventure resolves. Before the chapter ends, we are given a full page of optional events that might happen in Threshold, should the DM want to develop the party's experience in the town further. Again, this is an entirely unnecessary addition to the module, but the adventure is richer for it, being another example of how to bring an environment to life, the essence of expert level play. When the party are ready to leave Threshold, it's time for them to head to the Black Peak Mountains. These lie to the north of the town, and the tapestry map directs them to head up the Foamfire River, besides which they soon come across evidence of an ancient road heading north. Unfortunately, the Foamfire Valley is currently claimed by a bunch of fierce gnolls called the Death's Head Tribe, or the Galt Kalat. I really love how the writers have continued to offer indigenous names for all the humanoid tribes in this adventure. It has such far-reaching impact in terms of world building. The journey through the Foamfire Valley can be a dangerous one, and if you were to just look at this map, it would seem that there are no specific encounters detailed from Threshold to the Gorge at V1. However, this chapter details numerous encounters that may be played out over this journey, building an intensity until the party find themselves being hunted by the entire Death's Head tribe. The first bit of gruesome evidence that the party are in danger is when they come across the ravaged remains of a camp that has been destroyed by creatures that not only removed the heads of those that they killed, but ate most of them too. Not too far from this location, the party wander into the sacred burial ground of the Death's Head tribe, which can never be described as a good idea. The writers do an excellent job at conveying this scene as a misty, cold and unwelcoming place, especially as the party soon locate the heads of the hapless victims found earlier mounted on spears. And when the mist clears, the party are informed that there are many null corpses in various stages of decomposition, 
spread across the environment, impaled on spears in some kind of disturbingly alien ceremonial way. Clearly gnolls do not bury their dead. It's at this point that the party are beset by ghouls coming out of tunnels in the ground. Although the text doesn't explicitly state this, I made the ghouls gnoll in aspect, which conveyed quite a bit more fear to my players. What they don't know at this stage is that they're being spied upon by Kruzgat, the local shaman, who is sent for reinforcements which results in a bit of a pitched battle. I really played up the misty environment here, reducing visibility and ramping up the chaos. Kruzgat has a whole person spell which could severely weaken the party's effectiveness, so this encounter can be a bit touch and go, especially if any of the party have already been paralysed by ghouls. However, if the party successfully defeat Kruzgat and his contingent, then they have just killed the Death's Head tribe's holy man. Never a good thing. This leads to the party being hunted at speed through the Foamfire Valley. The Dungeon Master is advised to play up the sense of urgency by having the characters spot Null Scouts here and there, or be intercepted by small skirmishing parties, all the while getting the sense that the entire tribe is massing behind them. When I run this, I have the characters reach the gorge just as a war party of Nolls is overtaking them. I balance the number of this war party as appropriate, but it always contains the Noll chieftain and his bodyguards. However, I don't run this as a straight fight unless the characters choose to. I usually get the party to make intelligence checks to notice that the war party are keeping enough of a distance to curtail escape, but that they are also shepherding them towards what they soon notice is an ancient stone entrance at the foot of the gorge. Clearly, the Nolls think whatever's in there will be more effective at hurting the party than whatever they can bring to a fight. However disconcerting this may be for the characters, they are out of options, and so the party is driven forward towards the final chapter of the adventure. When they enter the doorway, the Nolls do not follow. The gorge has been won, but things are far from easy from here. Let's turn back to this map again and focus on the route to Hitaka. As you can see, the gorge entrance leads up to the top of the waterfall. From here, the DM might describe the horde of Death's Head Nolls, massing in the gorge below, drowned out by the waterfall but clearly waiting for something. Straddling the bridge across the waterfall is a gatehouse, and what the Nolls are waiting for is that the two steel living statues inside attack the party. What's so difficult about this? Well, these are particularly nasty opponents, as not only must they be hit with magical weapons, but any non-magical metallic weapon sticks to the creatures and gets absorbed. This can be a nasty fight, but it can also be avoided if a player with their wits about them presents their Hutaka needle to the statues. If so, the statues do not attack, and the party may proceed, much to the chagrin of the Nolls. I had the chieftain behead some of his own tribe members in a disgusted rage before the party were out of sight. The rest of this chapter is laid out in what I refer to as a number of trials. The adventure is quite linear here, and necessarily so, but the environment it's set in, and the sense of lost civilization wilderness it conveys, makes me think of those old Greek myth movies, such as Jason and the Argonauts, or the original Clash of the Titans. The road must be travelled, but you just don't know what peril is around the next corner. We are offered numerous natural encounters that must be overcome, such as a broken road, rockfall, or a narrowing of the path, and these can be quite difficult to traverse, especially if the party have horses. Speaking of horses, there's a great encounter whilst the party are crossing a bridge, when they are attacked by griffins. This can serve as a reminder that they move in the natural world, as the griffins are only after a bit of dinner and try to make off with any of the beasts of burden. Just be careful what you're packing on those animals in case you lose one, to griffins or an unfortunate fall. On encountering a fallen bridge, the party must come up with inventive ways of getting across, with all sorts of nastiness happening if they should fall although this could lead to the discovery of a perilous cave location. Eventually the ancient road leads to the gate of Hutaka, which is a pair of 15 foot tall stone doors, which of course are barred from the inside. However the party get them opened, they have to contend with the gate's guardians, a pair of rock living statues, but these also may be placated by brandishing the Hutaka needle. But once inside, the party have at last made it to the Lost Valley of Hutaka and the final chapter of this extensive module. The Lost Valley is described to us as a dim shadow of its former grandeur. The gate allows entry at the eastern side, and much of this area is uninhabited, although it is clear to the characters that the valley is lived in by something. It's not until the party reach the inhabited region highlighted that things really pick up, but the journey there should convey evidence of conflict between the jackal-headed Hutakans and the Traldar, although they probably wouldn't know who the Traldar are at this stage. 
They will also note that there is a large number of undead around for some reason. The running of this chapter can go a number of ways, but essentially, through interactions with either Hutarkans or the Traldar, or both, the party are expected to pick a side and help them in their conflict. What isn't explicit in the text is the objective of each race, but I think it's entirely implied that they both seek the other's extermination. However, they currently have bigger problems, but before I go into detail about that, let's have a closer look at the Hutarkans and the Traldar. As mentioned earlier, Hutarkans are a jackal-headed race, reminiscent of images found on Egyptian iconography. Hutarkans are a haughty and callous race, but actually see themselves as sensitive or even civilized. Hutarkan culture is quite religious and worship what is referred to as an amoral deity called Fla. As Hutarkan civilization expanded, they took advantage of the humans of the time, called Traldar, and enslaved them, although they don't see it that way, perceiving the Traldar revolt as ungrateful and calling them wreckers. The Traldar are primitive humans who have a cruel and embittered trait. Having once been enslaved by the Hutarkans, they see themselves as freedom fighters. Their mannerisms are quite aggressive and bloodthirsty, which is far from endearing. One key trait they have is a fear of the dark, which has actually been useful of late, given the amount of undead around. Both races are actually quite despicable, but even if the party do not choose to side with one or the other, they should at least listen to their predicaments. Recently there has been a development in the conflict between the two, in that the Traldar have driven the Hutarkans out of their sacred temple of Fla. However, a consequence of this has been undead spilling out of the temple and being a danger to everyone. This is because the Temple of Fla housed the corpses of long-dead Hutarkans, but when the Traldar occupied it, whatever practices the Hutarkans carried out to keep their dead restful have stopped, leading to a lot of jackal-headed skeletons and zombies roaming around. In addition to this problem, there is possibly an even bigger one. We are told that the valley has been home for millennia to a nightmarish creature called the Kartiba, or the Thing in the Pit, and that the priestesses of the temple used to placate and restrain the creature with special ceremonies, so that it would not range abroad. I'll enlighten you in a moment what these seem to have entailed. However, with the Hutarkans displaced from the temple, they can no longer carry out these ceremonies, and the Kartiba now accesses the valley at will, using underground tunnels to travel at night and find victims to feed on. So despite the characters expecting to find some lost valley of Shangri-La, they've actually stumbled upon two ancient peoples in the act of mutual destruction. Rational adventurers might let them get on with it, but those who can't help being the help will identify two objectives that the metaphorical thread has weaved. Deal with the undead problem and deal with the Kartiba. How the undead problem is dealt with depends on which race the party happens to be supporting or interacting with. If it's the Hutarkans, then the party must obtain something called the Knowledge of the Elders. If it's the Traldar, the party must obtain water from a place called a Singing Pool. Whichever option they choose, then requires the clearing of the temple to obtain a particular item to help them complete these ceremonies. If successful, all the undead in the valley immediately fall down dead dead. Whilst this element of the adventure can be fun, I am a little disappointed that there isn't really any difference here in terms of the outcomes of the ceremonies. I know I'm speaking as one who's behind the curtain, but knowing that the outcome is the same, no matter which race you choose, makes that choice seem meaningless. Given the animosity between the races, I think I'd change the outcome of the Hutakan ceremony to cause the undead to form a coherent force that marches on the Traldar to destroy them forever. This would demonstrate some understanding by the Hutakans about how these ceremonies might work, which I think would be right given the legacy dynamic between the races. But it would also demonstrate a clear difference in outcome that might get the players questioning their choice of race to help. However, there is still the issue of the Kartiba, although I think it would be perfectly understandable if the characters wanted to leave the thing to devour everyone in the valley. There's also the matter of accessing the valley's treasure housed in the temple, which, wouldn't you know it, requires a magical key that is currently embedded in the Kartiba's hide. The text clearly states that a knock spell is ineffective at gaining entrance to the treasure room, so it seems the final thread is sewn in the tapestry, and it is the fate of the party to face the Kartiba, to give this whole endeavour a purpose. If Stephen is still alive, I would certainly have him argue for this. The hunt for the Kartiba involves delving into the temple's catacombs, but if there was any doubt in terms of the horror the Hutarkans wielded in placating the Kartiba, the main hall of the Temple of Fla is clearly set up for human or humanoid sacrifice, with a man-sized cage that can be lowered into a large pit and down into the catacombs. The information about the cage and the pit is tucked away in the description of the main temple, and although it does not explicitly state that sacrifices to the Kartiba were made, 
it is heavily implied that this was the kind of ceremony that placated the creature for many years. We must also remember that this activity was foreshadowed in Biasket's notes to the priestesses that was found in Zitaka. Now it is plain what this meant in terms of what the Hutakan ceremonies were and how the Kartiba was placated. Regardless, the realization that it was down to sacrificial offerings should have a big impact on the characters, especially if they chose to help the jackal headed fiends. The ensuing foray into the catacombs can be a dangerous one, as the tunnels are lined in places with green slime and ochre jelly, as well as carrion crawlers that get 8 attempts per round to paralyze you and leave you for the hungry Kartiba. Assuming the party are triumphant, they will recover the key to the treasure room and relieve the temple of its riches. That said, far from being grateful for the help the party have given, both the Hutarkans and the Traldar turn on them to relieve them of the newly accessible treasure. I really like this idea, and it speaks to the despicable, duplicitous nature of both races. We are told to run this part of the adventure as a number of guerrilla type skirmishes, but ultimately the party needs to find a way to safely transport the cash back to civilization before they can truly complete this adventure and call it a success. And that brings the main adventure to a close. Characters could expect to rise at least a couple of levels on completion. Smaller parties will gain more. The module does go the extra mile once again by offering a final chapter called Further Adventures, which is a really handy prompt for DMs wanting to expand this adventure into a greater campaign. Specifically, it suggests dealing with the journey back and meeting with a vengeful Death's Head tribe, or the DM could take a dark turn with events and have the party arrive at Sukiskin with Stephen to find it burnt to the ground, with evidence that the Iron Ring were the culprits. You may wish to develop threshold beyond the information in these pages, and some adventure prompts are given. Or you could suggest the party seek more Hutarkan treasures out there in the wilderness of Karamekos. There is the potential to come to the aid of gnome clans experiencing problems with more goblins, which might be fun for powerful characters wanting to extend some god mode wrath. And for a more expansive and potentially political campaign, there is dealing with the Iron Ring itself, especially if they have raised Sukiskin to the ground. It's all in the Dungeon Master's hands. To paraphrase a famous hobbit, the adventure never really ends, and the story has to continue. What an epic adventure. I have to say, reading through this module again reinforces my belief that it is practically a standalone campaign, one that could easily be supported by the Grand Duchy of Karamekos Gazetteer, with a few tweaks to ensure continuity and consistency. Apart from the obvious strengths this module has, what I haven't spent much time on is how this adventure is laid out, as it makes maximum use of the page space with information sidebars detailing NPC and monster stats, so that you don't have to keep referring to the rulebook. And let's not forget those magnificent maps, which, when compared to almost every module I can think of at the top of my head, have us really spoiled. One thing I have to admit is that Night's Dark Terror has been enormously influential on how I flesh out NPCs and thread together locations to develop a campaign. Even the way it presents the Iron Ring as not just bandits, but as a hierarchical organization, with reavers, hounds and masters, and humanoids as having their own cultures, practices and indigenous names. This kind of stuff has been so inspirational and my own work has benefited from it. What I also want to draw your attention to is the illustrations by Helen Bedford. There's something so evocative about them that I struggle to put my finger on it. I think it's an old world element that conveys mystery or hints at greater mysteries. Every time I pick up my copy of this module, my eye is captivated by them. I just find them so nostalgic, but in a different way than, say, Elmore's or Easley's work. They're a fantastic tribute to an amazing module. I'll say it again to anyone who wants to listen. If you're looking to develop your Beckney campaign, you can do a lot worse than introduce Night's Dark Terror to your group. It's got enough right out of the book, but it's also flexible enough for you to turn this adventure in any direction you please, and the scope of the Iron Ring just begs to be explored further. What flaws it does have are few and far between and easily forgiven. And so I hope you enjoyed my review or walkthrough of B10 Night's Dark Terror. What's been your experience of it? How did your players interact with the goblins of Dimrak Forest? Did they come a cropper in Zitaka? Or did they fall to the slimy Kartiba? It would be great to know. Otherwise, please give this video a like if you did indeed like it, and please hit the subscribe button if I've earned your future attention. If you'd like to thank me further, you can buy me a coffee, link on the screen or in the description. I'm Bake Me Berserker. Keep making your saving throws, and I hope to see you back here soon.